So you take a full beer, right? Don't pop it. Don't pop the top on it. I know you have to buy canned beer because you're a student. You have no money. So, so you, but you can stand on a full beer can because you're compressing the, because the fluid inside uh, holds you up. You, you chug your beer, put it down on the ground. You go, and it crushes like a grape. Good morning. Happy Monday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Wow, got a busy Monday coming up. Um, quick reminder for those of you that are IFAST University members, we have a conference call today at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so please be there for the live call if you can. Those are always great, great questions. Uh, speaking of questions, today's Q&A is with Victor, and we covered a lot of ground in this call. A couple of main, main elements, though, was uh, the influence of body position on the table as how it uh, can change um, the perception of some of your measures and why you might see certain things in certain positions as you change position on the table. And then why do we restrict uh, relative motion to produce force and how this, this actually influences things. So I give a couple of examples that are hopefully useful under those circumstances. Um, if you would like to participate in a 15 minute consultation, please go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com. Put a 15 minute consultation in the subject line so we can arrange that at our mutual convenience. Um, got to run, got a busy day. You guys have a great Monday and I'll see you tomorrow. So the camera is rolling. The clock has started. Victor, <laughs> <laughs> I've been calling you Jenny this whole time. Uh, Victor, what is your question? All right, so I've been going through uh, trying to get some expansion. My uh, anterior thorax, posterior thorax, just for my own progress. And I've noticed, like when I lay supine, now my ribs don't flare as much. What does that so mean? What does that mean? That the anterior inferior portion of my rib cage does not uh, protrude, or I guess I'm not as posteriorly tilted in the thorax as much as I was. Mm -hmm. uh when i lay supine okay so the question became why getting expansion the upper thorax both the upper back and the and the anterior thorax might help that um i actually have my poor skeleton model missing a oh, leg nice. here there you go i pictured this as like a lower posterior compression and anterior upper compression almost tilting the the whole thorax posteriorly Okay. But that's my thought. I just wanted to hear what you have to say about that. Okay. So so under most circumstances, what you're actually what you're actually representing is the anterior orientation in the pelvis and in the thorax. But when you lay down, there's a tipping point where there's enough mass above this point where you're you're mostly tilted forward, where everything will fall back. And so it creates this perception of of the lower rib cage being positioned anteriorly. So, so people get this confused as they say, but I have a posterior orientation. No, you don't, you have an anterior orientation. The constraint of, of the surface upon which you are, you are lying is, is creating an upward force. And so then the shape of your, your thorax and pelvis actually um, change its orientation to whatever degree is allowed. Now, in some cases, there's so much, <clears throat> excuse me, in some cases, there's so much compression that people don't tilt backwards on the table. And in some cases they do. And so this is one of those things that skews measurement. So, so when I talk about the usefulness of iterations and then your checks and balances between your ERs and IRs, this is where a lot of people get confused because they say, Bill, my numbers don't match. And I say, yes, they do. You just have to account for the shape change that's associated with the constraints because it's no different. It's no different than somebody actually having a true constraint change in a joint that creates a limitation in motion or, or an increase in range of motion. So like, I don't know, take like a, a, a labrum tear in a shoulder will magnify a uh, range of motion in one direction and take it away in, in another, right? That would be a representation of like a constraint change that's internal mm -hmm. that we do nothing about. But basically that's what you've done. So, so, the, so the, the, that's the beauty, if you will, of the table tests is that it does create a constraint for us to make a comparison against, but you just have to know what the rules are in that regard. It's like in, in some cases, 
People are going to reorient themselves relative to the table. In some cases, they won't. And so, again, if you understand that, then there's a tremendous amount of clarity and usefulness in your, if you do, if you're one of those people that do table tests, then they become very useful because there's checks and balances throughout that, that clarify what really is going on in regards to the shape of the individual. Okay. Yeah. So on your point of like somebody might be so compressed that they don't tip posteriorly, but somebody could also be compressed, but they will tip so, posteriorly. Correct. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Okay. okay. So you're measuring traditional shoulder flexion on somebody. Okay. Right? The person that doesn't tilt back has a very significant degree of shoulder flexion limitation. So let's just say mm. if, if you're using comparisons to the, to the averages that they teach you in school, which are absolutely wrong, then we would say that this person, let's just say they have a hundred degrees of traditional shoulder flexion. Okay. And then you have the person that tilts backwards. Okay. Uh, let me back up. So let's just say they have hundred degrees of traditional shoulder flexion. And they have about 70 degrees of traditional shoulder external rotation as you would measure on the table. Okay. Mm -hmm. Take the other person, the person that hits the table rolls backwards. They now have a magnification of those two measures. So even though shoulder flexion may be limited to a significant degree, they might show like 150 to 180 degrees of shoulder flexion, and they'll show you 120 degrees of shoulder external rotation by traditional measures. And so what happens, and incorrectly, is these people get branded with, with that so-called uh, concept of laxity, and that doesn't happen. Right. It's just, yeah. it's just an orientation on the table in this circumstance. It's not looseness anywhere, but, but if, if that's the, if that's the model that I've used because it is the structural reductionist way, right. They say, Oh, anytime you get an excessive measure because their concept is like, I'm looking through this, this, this singular lens, right. I'm looking at your hip or I'm just looking at your shoulder and I'm not considering the fact that, that ER and IR are systemic measures. They're not isolated to a, an area um, until, until you have the superficial compressive strategies, then they are isolated to that area. That's why the measures suck, right? So when I have limitation in a joint range of motion up significant degree, that's pretty indicative of that superficial compression, right? Because when I move a shoulder, everything has to move. Yeah. And that's, what's, I, that's what, what's underappreciated because again, at school, they teach you like the shoulder moves this much. It's like, no, when you measure ER at this point in this way, it has this much. There are many contributors to that range of motion. It is not just because you're saying I'm measuring the shoulder doesn't mean you're measuring the shoulder. I'm sorry. You're, yeah. you're absolutely wrong, right? You're measuring the system. Yeah. It's kind of like being called Johnny. It's just not my name. <laughs> well, that's your own damn fault. <laughs> You're the one. Your email comes to me and it says, yeah. right? It's like, come on. Fair what am I going to say? And then you you didn't correct me. That's your fault. I, that is. That is. I'm just messing. <laughs> um, so I have a perfect example of that. So I was working with my dad, right shoulder pain, racquetball for like the last 20 years. Super limited shoulder range of motion on that side. Yeah. So I'm doing like tractioning the scapula, turning his head towards me, getting some big breaths, like trying to expand the upper back. And then his ER improved. And then I worked to get his rib cage a little bit more, I guess, would be anteriorly tilted or uh, on the table. So bring his rib cage from posterior orientation more, I guess, flat. And then his, his ER got worse. And the old me would have been like, oh man, that's like in the moment I was like, oh man, I how why did that make it worse and then i realized what you just said it was a whole reorientation we didn't actually get we might have got some expansion up or back but yeah we have to <clears throat> get the whole orientation and then get the expansion there's a, there's, a, there's a there's a chance that that you just um by, by traditional representation is that you flexed the thorax you did not expand it posteriorly if i bend the spine forward that is not necessarily expansion yeah okay you, you see what yes yeah, you did? So, yeah so well when i when is before so i measured his er it was like 
maybe like 20 degrees, 30 degrees. Pretty yeah. horrendous. Yeah. And then so I just did, he was laying supine, took his right arm, tractioned it, kind of like AB duction of the scapula, turned <laughs> his head towards me, get some big breaths, and yep. then his ER just dropped like yeah. to 80, 90 degrees. Cool. Yeah. And then I, we worked on some rest for more respiration. Rib cage looked a little bit more, like I said, anterally tilted or flat in the lower posterior part. And his ER got worse again. And that's, I was yeah. like, okay, well, might as well start here, I think. Cause I think I've heard you say before, like that's kind of the first, like reorient first and Always. then work on the expansion. Always reorient. Yeah. Because you, you can't re reacquire all of the relative motions without reorientation because the, the orientation is caused by the superficial musculature locking segments together, right? Mm -hmm. So if they all move together, there's no relative motion there. If there's no relative motion, then there is no expansive capabilities where things have to move. They literally have to move apart to create the space. And so if they can't do that, then you're not going to get the change. You might get, you might actually get another reorientation, which, which, it, it, the whole segment turns and that sort of magnifies some of your, your ERs and IRs as well. But again, it's not the true relative motions. And the way you would know that is because you would just measure all your other stuff and you make your comparisons. You can go, well, wait a minute, that doesn't really fit. And that's how you know that you had something that like a whole segment of the body turned, like the whole pelvis turned or the whole thorax turned because you get a magnification of one measure, but you don't get restoration of the others. I gotcha. Yeah, so it's like that's, why there's, check, that's why there's checks and balances that are built in, right? Yeah, and so we take advantage of those. That's and again, that's how you know when what what you're looking at, and you know whether your intervention actually worked. Because you know people throw these little little parties when they make these these subtle gains in motion, and all they're getting is changes in orientation, not the relative motions. If relative motion is the goal, and in many cases, yeah. when you're dealing with people that that they're dealing with with pain related issues um th the starting point is to restore relative motions first and foremost mm -hmm. you eliminate all other possibilities as to as to what it may be yeah that makes sense yeah um yeah, when you were talking about relative motions this brought up another question that i've had <sighs> why i might be incorrect in my thinking it seems like based on everything that i've heard you say that increasing relative motion increase uh -oh. force production and vice versa and i'm just curious to time. why you cut out on me for just a second please repeat it oh no worries if i increase relative motions that that would decrease force production capabilities yes and vice versa yes but i'm having a hard time understanding why that would be okay <clears throat> so i live in indianapolis I'm going to tell you an Indianapolis story, okay? And and I I know very little about racing, right? The Indianapolis 500 is big here for some reason. I'm not really sure. It's probably like one of the oldest races ever, right? Anyway, so here's here's one of the things that I did learn about these things. So, so the older cars <clears throat> were made out of the the fewest number of pieces possible, right? So they were very heavy, and they were they were one piece, and and the drivers would hit the wall at high speeds. Right. There's there's accidents that happen in, in these races. Right. So they would hit the wall and the cars would would be held together. And so the driver would end up absorbing all of this force. Right. So I had one one car, one driver, basically two pieces. OK, they hit the wall. Car doesn't car doesn't collapse like literally these things were made out of metal and and stuff and then the driver absorbs and so they had so many more injuries and deaths associated with the with the accidents what the cars do now is they explode okay so when so when when the car hits it breaks into a gajillion million pieces right as many pieces as it, as it can break apart into. And what this does is each one of those pieces absorbs some of the impact and spreads the impact out. Right, so then the driver doesn't absorb the force. The, the all, all the little pieces do, okay, and so so that's dissipating the force among many parts, okay. Mm -hmm. 
So, so the driver doesn't absorb it and the driver doesn't get hurt. So, so, so their survivability is increased. Their, their risk of injury goes down dramatically. Okay. That's relative motion. All of these little pieces represent. So each one of these pieces absorbs some of this. So it dampens all the force that the driver doesn't absorb it. You are the same way. The more moving parts you have, okay. The more moving parts you have, the more you distribute the force. And so if I distribute the force, it can't be focal enough to have any significant input. So I have to lock things together so I can produce the maximum forces. And then I release that. And then that's what allows me to demonstrate velocity. So let's go back to the car example. So those pieces go flying at hundreds of miles an hour, right? They go really fast. They, they fly apart really, really fast. Okay, mm -hmm. like it's like an explosion. We follow the same rules. So, so we have to compress and squeeze and limit relative motions to produce high forces. Velocity is the other end of the spectrum. We got to have lots of lots of uh, expansive capabilities available to demonstrate the velocities because they're not the same. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So I guess my confusion still is like, let's say I'm squatting. I have like a 500 pound barbell on, on my back, and I'm going to yep. do a back squat. Yeah. So I still have to produce, well, probably like more than 500 pounds to actually move the bar. Um, whether I dissipate the forces through across my whole body versus locking everything down, I still have to produce the same amount of force. So I guess my confusion is why does decreasing the relative motions and making the, the force focal help me? specifically like limiting the relative motions why is that beneficial because to, in my mind i would have to produce the same amount of force anyway is that my question but, make sense? but see but, but see you're you're okay so what direction do the forces go if you if you're not locked into a single piece what direction do they go do they go up into the bar or they go all different directions like the exploding direction yeah, you see so so again it's like you're, okay. you, have to, you have to direct the force to produce the outcome that you want Right. There's, there's no way there's no way to do it if you don't lock everything into one piece. Get it. OK. Yeah, yeah that makes way more. Oh. Especially with your model with the more like fluid based physics perspective, like that makes more sense to me. Yes. Well, we'll you, so, okay. so you you lift you lift heavy things with columns of water. OK, always remember that. Got it. <laughs> okay. Because, because muscles can't lift them. Can you elaborate? Nope. All right. No, muscles can't do anything. They can, they can squeeze things really, really tight. Right. Okay. So hang on. Let's, let's, let's empty your guts. Your gut is now hollow. Okay. And I'm going to put that 500 pound barbell on your back. What do you think is going to happen? That you're barbell's crushed. Yeah. You're gonna get crushed like a paper cup. Okay. All right. Here you go. You ever smash? You ever smash a pop can? Yeah. An empty pop yeah. can. Okay. okay. Hang on. You ever stand on a full pop can? I have not. No. Okay, but you can. Oh, maybe, I'm sorry. You're you're a student, right? I am. I, I should have said beer can. So you take a full beer, right? Don't pop it. Don't pop the top on it. I know you have to buy canned beer because you're a student, you have no money. So, so you, but you can stand on a full beer can because you're compressing the, because the fluid inside uh, holds you up. You, you chug your beer, put it down on the ground, you go and it crushes like a grape, right? Yeah. So what, there's the difference. So what the muscles do is they squeeze, they contain the fluid in a shape that allows you to stack weight on top of it. Oh, okay. Simple yeah. mechanics, my friend. Simple mechanics. Yeah. I'm not that smart. So I got to use this <laughs> stuff. Right? You explain complex things pretty simply. So, uh, well, you know, you just have to drink a few beers and then, you know, you pretty much solve the world's problems. Right. <laughs> All right, man. I got to uh, cut you off. Yeah. Good questions. Uh, awesome. You're going to help a lot of people. All right, man. All right.